Liquify is found under the distort category. And this is an effect that was in Photoshop and basically any photo manipulation software for as long as I can remember. The first time that I sat down and learned how to actually manipulate an image, I used a twirl distortion. And that's just one of the many distortions that Liquify allows you to create. I'm just gonna start by dragging it out onto my logo and it's showing you what controls we have. There are actually multiple tools in this effect that show up as a brush when you hover over the comp and they all manipulate your image in a different way. So by default, it's set to the first option, which is called warp. If I just click and drag around, it's going to push pixels around wherever I'm clicking and dragging. And to make it clear what exactly is happening here, I'm gonna go into the view options and check on this box that says view mesh. Now this is a really fine mesh, so I'm gonna zoom in nice and close, but you can see that where I wasn't clicking, it's just a regular grid, and down here in the middle where I was actually clicking and dragging, that mesh has been manipulated and the pixels underneath it have been manipulated with it. So let me just reset this effect, turn that mesh back on and show you that we have different mesh sizes that we can choose from, small, medium, or large. I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think this actually affects render time or how fine of a distortion you're actually making when using these tools. So what I mean by that is if I were to make a warp on this side with the large mesh, and then I switched this to small, and then I clicked and dragged over here, I don't think that this distortion is any less detailed than what I have over here. I'm pretty sure that's just a preview size. It doesn't actually affect the distortion resolution. I'm gonna switch mine up to large just so we can see it nice and clearly, and let's walk through all of these tools that we have access to. We've already taken a look at warp, which just allows you to push and pull pixels around, making that distortion as you go. And with any of these tools, I can change the brush size by either going into the warp tool options, this will change depending on what tool we have selected, and increasing or decreasing the brush size right there, or while I'm over the comp, just hold down the control or command key on a Mac, and then click and drag left and right to increase or decrease the size of the brush. We also have brush pressure, which changes how much distortion each tool applies. So once again, let me reset this, I'll make my brush a little bit bigger and set the brush pressure up to 100. That's the maximum value. And now when I click and drag, it's going to make a huge amount of distortion. But if I turn this down to a brush pressure of 10, and then I click and drag it down here, it's hardly making any distortions at all. I need to go up to probably around 30 before I really start to see things being manipulated again. All right, let's jump back up to the tools and look at the next option. This is turbulence. I'll make my brush nice and large, and then if I click and drag, it's actually applying a turbulent distortion. If I zoom in here, you can see that this is no longer smooth. If I turn the effect off and back on, and I could turn the turbulent jitter up so that it's more dramatic, and maybe increase the brush pressure as well, just so we can see this very clearly. It's just kind of scrambling those pixels around, and if I turn my grid on, you can see exactly what's happening there. All right, let's reset the effect. The next two options are twirl clockwise and twirl counterclockwise. And this is that distortion I was talking about at the beginning. If I make my brush size fairly large and then click and just hold down, it's going to continue twirling around that brush point. With this option, it's in the clockwise direction. If I undo and switch to the counterclockwise, then it'll twirl in the opposite direction. And I can move my brush around as I do this to on the fly change where that center rotation point is coming from. So that is a technique that you'll have to get used to. Holding down the mouse button will increase that distortion and moving it around will change where that distortion comes from. Next up is pucker and bloat. So the pucker tool is going to shrink stuff down. It's gonna pull pixels in towards the center of that brush and the bloat tool is going to push those pixels outwards from the center of the brush. The next tool is shift pixels and this one is a little bit more random. If I click and drag, it's kind of just randomly moving stuff around. But what's actually happening if I click and drag straight down is it's moving the pixels perpendicular to the direction that I'm moving my brush. So if I go right to left, the pixels are gonna move down. Or if I go left to right, the pixels are gonna move up. The next tool is reflection. And this one is a little hard to wrap your head around. It seems to just do whatever it wants and it gives a lot of distortion. If I turn that brush pressure way down to maybe say 20 and then click and drag, it almost looks like a mirror that has a dent in it. There's a lot of distortion to it and it really makes whatever you're applying it to go nuts. So maybe I wanna turn that even further down to say a value of 10. I'll have to reset my effect and then do that and then just try that one more time. I'm just clicking and barely dragging around the center here so you can see what's happening. The further I go, the more distorted it gets. 
Next is the clone tool, and this is very similar to the clone stamp tool right up here, but instead of just cloning pixels, it's cloning the distortion. So if I grab the twirl tool and I just spin my hair around like this a little bit, and then I grab my clone tool, let me turn the grid on so we can see this. Let's say I want this distortion up here to also be applied down here. Well, first I'll grab the clone tool, hold down Alt or Option on a Mac to sample that part of the distortion map, click once, and then move down here, and then just click and drag to clone that distortion mesh down at this section of the grid. Finally, we have the reconstruction tool, and this is going to basically undo what you've done. So if I click and drag, it's restoring the mesh back to where it was. Maybe that was a little too quick. I'll change this down to 30, and then just paint this back on a little at a time, clicking and dragging as I go. But we actually have some options for this reconstruction tool. It's set to revert by default, which is what we just did. We reverted the distortion back to its original mesh, but we could change this to displace, which will reconstruct still, but it's also allowing me to kind of pull that mesh back into a direction that I'm actually dragging my mouse. So you see how that's not going back to where it was originally like it does with revert. It's actually allowing me to displace that mesh while reconstructing it. The next option is Ampli Twist. And if I go ahead and just twirl my layer one more time so that we have some rotation in this distortion mesh, maybe I need to turn up my pressure to 50 again and I'll turn my brush size down as well. I'll give a nice twirl right here in the distortion mesh. The Ampli Twist reconstruction mode is going to change most of that distortion back to the way that it was, but you'll notice that this distortion mesh is still rotated in the direction that I had twirled. So it's back to being a square grid, but that rotation is preserved. And then finally, Affine is going to do a very similar thing. It's going to account for any type of distortion, but reconstruct everything based on that point that I had clicked on. So if I undo, because this point right here is facing this direction, when I click and drag, all the distortions are going to revert to that same section of that distortion mesh, essentially applying that distortion to everything that I click and drag on. So those are all of the tools and all of the tool options. I'm going to reset this effect one more time. We've looked at the view options. The only things that are left are the distortion mesh, which is just a keyframe value, which allows you to change that mesh over time. So if I want the distortion mesh to be just like it is at the start, I'll just set a keyframe and then go forward maybe a second. And let's add in some twirl again. This time I'll go counterclockwise and we'll just rotate this mesh around to get this twirly distortion and it's automatically added another keyframe because I adjusted my distortion mesh. And now it's going to interpolate between those two values. I could easy ease this so that it's a little bit smoother, but that's what the distortion mesh property is for. We have a distortion mesh offset, which is a point value. If I turn my grid back on, and again, I'll set it to large so we can see it clearly. This point control is up in the top left corner, but I can click and drag this to shift that mesh around within the layer contents. And this is really useful if you need to track that distortion mesh on top of footage, which we're gonna take a look at in a second. I'll reset that back to zero, zero. And the next option is distortion percentage. This is another really great way of enabling or disabling your distortion. If I set a keyframe at 100% and then I go forward a little bit and turn it down to zero, we're going back to our unaffected state. So I'll press U to bring up the keyframes and just scrub between these two and you'll see that it's reverting the mesh back to the way that it was. So really, you only need to have distortion mesh keyframes if you plan on changing your distortion mesh throughout your animation. If all you wanna do is go from the undistorted state to the distorted state, then you can just use distortion percentage. But here's another really cool thing. You can increase distortion percentage beyond 100%. If I click and drag, it's going to amplify the distortion that I've applied up to a maximum of 200%. That can be really useful. Now there's one more feature of Liquify that I wanna show you before we jump to another example. So let me reset this effect, get rid of the keyframes, and with pretty much any of these tools, we have what's called a freeze area mask. So if I just drag a rectangle mask across the center of my layer and change it to none, so it's not actually hiding anything, but it's there. And then I press F to bring up the mask feather and just increase this to around 42 pixels, that's good. I'll zoom in a little bit closer and switch to my warp tool. Make sure that freeze area mask is set to that mask that I just drew. And now if I click and drag, everything contained within that mask is going to be frozen in place, or at least close to it. I feathered out the mask, so there is a little bit of distortion happening within it. 
if I didn't feather the mask and then tried to manipulate this, then it's going to be really harsh. It's not going to have a good transition between the affected and unaffected parts. Now, this is a little bit backwards than my brain wants to think about things. I would really like to be able to invert the mask so that it's freezing everything that's not within the box, but I can't do that even if I change this to subtract. It's always going to freeze what's contained within the mask, not what's on the outside. So let's say I wanted to affect everything but the hair. I would need to draw a path around just the hair. Again, set that to none, set that as my freeze area, and then twirl the face as much as I want and it's not gonna do anything to the hair. But now that I've distorted my logo over and over, let's jump over to another example. I'm gonna show you very quickly how you can track someone's face and then apply the liquify effect to it so that it stays attached to their face and looks correct the whole time. Now this is just a simple clip of me smiling and then not smiling. So why don't we go to a point where I'm smiling nice and big and apply the liquify effect, except I'm going to do it on an adjustment layer just so I can separate it from the footage. So I'm gonna go up to layer, new adjustment layer, and I'll rename this liquify, and I'll apply the effect right to that. Now, before I even start manipulating anything, I need to track my face. Fortunately, After Effects has a really great facial tracker built right in. So all you need to do to track somebody's face is start by drawing a rough mask around their face. So this does not have to be extremely precise, it's just enough to give After Effects an idea of where the facial features are on the footage. I'm going to press the M key to bring up the masks and change this to none so that we're not actually manipulating the image, and then go up to Window, down to Tracker, and the tracker is going to automatically detect that I want to do a face track. Now there are two options here, face tracking outline only and face tracking detailed features. We want the detailed features because this is going to give us tracking points that we can target with the liquify effect. So with that selected, I'm just going to click the play button. It'll take a second to recognize, but as you can see, it tracks my face very quickly and very precisely with lots of tracking points. And just like that, the track is done. I have lots of position data now that I can pull from while using liquify. So if I zoom in here nice and close, there's a point right at the bridge of my nose that's tracked, and that's a really great central location that's on the same plane roughly as my eyes and my mouth. So if I were to have my distortion mesh, which again, I'll turn that on and set it to large, following that track, then the distortions that I make on this frame should follow my face as it moves around. So let's actually do that right now. I'm going to find that tracking data underneath the face track points, nose, nose bridge. I'm gonna double tap the S key to solo that property. And then I'm going to double click on the distortion mesh offset to bring it up down here and double tap the S key again. So I'm just looking at those two properties. All I wanna do is use the property pick whip to select that nose bridge. Now my distortion mesh is going to follow that part of my face. So I could go to this frame right here. I'll turn off the grid and really just bulge out the lower part of my face. So I have a giant mouth now, <laughs> it looks ridiculous. I'll give my neck a little bit of a bloat too. And now that distortion should stay pretty locked in place. So as I scrub through this, you see that that distortion mesh point is tracking along with the bridge of my nose and the distortion is following pretty nicely. Now, if we take a look at the relative position of the eyes, this might not work as well because I rotate my head a little bit. So while the bridge of my nose looks like it's just moving left and right, this eye moves down a bit. So let me just bulge that eye out and show you what I mean. If I just increase the size of that one, and let's do this one for good measure as well. So now I have big eyes. If I back this up, you see how those two distortions didn't track as well going from this angle to that angle. So in this case, what I would do is just undo those distortions and I'll rename this liquify mouth. And then I'll duplicate it and rename this one left eye. And this will be from my perspective, so my left eye. Then I'll just double tap E to open up the expressions and then just change the name here to the actual tracker that I'm interested in, which is the left pupil. If I open up my face track points again, go into the left eye section, left pupil is what I want. So I can simply just type in left pupil instead of nose bridge. So left pupil, that is case sensitive, click off. And now my distortion mesh is going to be tracked to that pupil instead of the bridge of my nose. I'm gonna to need to reset my distortion mesh so it's not carrying over that giant chin bloat that I created. And now I'll bloat out this eye. So I'll just increase the size there. And now that should follow that eyeball 
pretty much dead on, and it's doing a really good job there. I'll even make that a little bit bigger for good measure. And then I'll just duplicate that liquify, rename this one right eye, double tap E, change the expression to target the right pupil. That updates. Again, I'll have to reset that mesh, grab the bloat tool, make it nice and big, and then click and drag to bloat that eye out. Now I've got really big cartoon eyes. I might have taken that a little bit too far, so let me just back off the distortion percentage until it matches the other eye a little bit more closely. And now that's gonna track a little bit better. Now I just noticed that my left eye is no longer working, so I've gotta figure out what's going on here. And it looks like I accidentally applied that bloat on the mouth liquify, not the eye liquify. So make sure you're keeping track of which instance of liquify you're working with. I'm just gonna reconstruct that area of the eyeball real quick just until the eye is back to normal, go to the left eye instance, grab that bloat, click and drag, and I'm actually having a little bit of trouble getting behind that distortion mesh offset value. After Effects thinks that I'm trying to click on that. So if you run into that issue, one easy way to get around that is to just add a simple little line at the end of this expression. Let me close this panel and give myself a little bit more room here. What I wanna do is just take that track point and say plus value which if I grab that left eye now will allow me to shift this point around to wherever I want and it's still going to be tracked to that pupil. That distortion point just won't be exactly over it, which is fine. As long as the mesh is moving at the same rate as the track point, it will all work just fine. So I'll grab that bloat tool one more time, click and expand that eye out, and now I've got a pretty decent track of my eyes and mouth as my head moves around. But I don't want that distortion to happen until this point in time, so let's set a keyframe on the distortion percentage for all three instances of Liquify. Press U to bring up those keyframes. Go back to where I'm not smiling right there and turn all of these down to zero. Then I can easy ease these keyframes and maybe make the easing a little bit more extreme here in the graph editor. Play this back and now it animates on. And then I can find the point where I stop smiling and just reverse these keyframes. So I'll copy and paste, right click, go down to the bottom where it says keyframe assistant and time reverse keyframes is at the very bottom of the next menu and then it will animate back off. So there's my big meme to face that comes on and goes off. Now from here I could do anything else that I want. The mouth liquify is tracked to the bridge of my nose. So if I wanted to say bloat out my entire forehead, I could do that but I might wanna change the order of the liquefies so that the eyes are distorted first and then my mouth and forehead. Otherwise, it could push the eyes around before they're bloated out, which would throw off the tracking data. So let me just really extremely bloat out my big brain, make that nice and big, and I've successfully turned myself into a meme. This is obviously completely silly. I'm just having a lot of fun here. I could do this all day, but that's everything you need to know about the liquefy effect, and I will leave you with one final example. Oh, I got a new YouTube comment. These are always so positive. What's with the cartoonish hair? I can't even watch this. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this tutorial, then check out the other ones here on my YouTube channel. And if you like my teaching style, then definitely check out my longer form content on Skillshare and School of Motion. And if you want to support more tutorials like this one, check out my Patreon. You can find links for all that stuff in the description of this video.